Hello, hello, hello guys. This is your girl Nadra. Welcome back to my channel. So today I want to talk to you about how I just feel the energy around King Charles III's coronation is really not made up of the same level of excitement, of hope, that there was around Queen Elizabeth II's coronation and we're going to take a look at some things together. Um, some actual art articles from the time back in 1953 when Queen Elizabeth II was crowned um, and discuss, we, we basically know about all the Not My King protests and things like that, but just kind of discuss this level of really kind of lack of anticipation, pessimism, indifference um, around King Charles III's coronation. So um, before we get into that, I actually have been catching up a lot on my Sussex Squad um, 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 content. So I looked at some stuff from Sussex Squad Family TV, some stuff from Tisa Tells, and it is just horrendous. It's really, really horrendous what's happening right now. Like, for example, um, Tisa Tells, she, she made a video basically talking about how um, Camilla's grandchildren will be participating in the coronation. She, she's hilarious. She basically made some speculation about whether or not uh, maybe Camilla's kids are Charles's kids because, you know, he's really go gung-ho. You know, he's really going hard on having them participate when we know that William isn't participating, Harry isn't participating, so it's a little bit bizarre. Um, we know that Harry recently traveled to the UK for the, um, the trial with the Daily Mail, with the Daily Fail, and King Charles could, of course, couldn't carve some time out of his busy schedule just to go see his son, which we know it's not about him carving time out of his busy schedule to go see his son. It's more just about, um, something is wrong there. Something is wrong there. You know, I'm looking at... First of all, I have been very, very clear about this stance from the very beginning. I think that the United Kingdom's biggest mistake was from the very beginning, seven years ago in 2016, when the, the, the UK public was sending loads of racist, uh, sexist, xenophobic hate towards Meghan Markle's way. The United Kingdom, this whole time, should have been very resolute in their stance and showing Racism, xenophobia, sexism will not be tolerated here. Making public statements about this in their platform and showing it through the causes that they are involved in. But of course, the UK is not going to do that because they are profitizing off of this. They're monetizing this. And they have been, there's been a corrupt um, relationship between the firm, between the monarchy, and the UK tabloid media for a very, very long time. This is something that has become ingrained. And um, we're going to take a look at some of the articles, some of the newspapers from like 1953. Because, yeah, this right here, when we look at the stuff with Queen Elizabeth, it's going to show that hyperventilating, agro-nerd uh, British people has been a thing. <laughs> it's been a thing for a really, really, really long time. Um... But basically, guys, what, what, what is up with that? You know, what is up with that? And what can we do about it? I'll tell you what we can do about it. The media in the UK needs to be reformed. There needs to be reforms. Just like I've said in, uh, about concerning the US, Donald Trump is one of the biggest threats right now to modern democracy. One of the biggest threats. And this is global. This is not just in the United States. This is all around the world. His hateful rhetoric is reverberating around the world and it's given that green light to those white supremacists that just say, hey, come on out of the woodworks. It's good. You can come out of the woodworks, you know. For people who don't understand those implications, I would tell you, A, very small step you can make from the beginning, go get yourself some black and brown friends. Because I cannot imagine that you are close to anyone in your life who has a history with, you know, enslavement, racism, uh, deep, deep felt ancestral persecution. I can't imagine you have any relation with anybody on a deep level because those people would have flagged you down years ago, okay? But beyond that, read some books, you know, read some books outside of your own perspective. Like, the thing is, is, um, 
I was looking at, so Tisa tells, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to speculate about the thing with Camilla's grandkids or anything like that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to speculate about it. But what I will say is I look at King Charles III and I see some parallels between he, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. Um, now, I know that is a very, very strong statement to make, but the, the similarities that I see... Oh, and Netanyahu as well. Let's go ahead and throw Netanyahu in there as well. The thing is, is that all of these world leaders are seemingly promoting, if not perpetuating, but promoting far-right prejudice, you know, ex excluding rhetorics, excluding um, initiatives that are affecting the most people of color, people of a religion outside of white Christian people, women, and poor people. Uh, okay, that's, that's basically where it goes. And it's like, at that point, people keep flagging them down. Hey, hey, what you're doing is really hurting people. What you're doing is really, really hurting people, but they just keep on going. You know, that's what that's what I see from King Charles, from Vladimir Putin, from Trump and Netanyahu. So it makes me wonder, really, really just, you know, from someone who's studied a bit of psychology, studied a bit of law, studied a little bit of politics, a bit of art history. I mean, I've studied a little bit of everything. It makes me wonder if these people aren't grappling with some sort of personality disorders. I've said that before and I really stick to it. I don't think that we're just dealing with sane people here. The, the scariest thing is that these are the people who are in power. Now to come back to King Charles for a second. What he has, the, the complicity, the lack of action that he's taken to show the British public that hate racism, xenophobia, sexism should not be tolerated in 2023 in Britain. And all of that hate that's been targeted towards Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, I think that, um, again, there could have been like very concerted efforts that he could have made along the way. The fact that he did not make those concerted efforts, this is what that's done. The fact that he didn't make those concerted efforts has told people who are either secretly racist, secretly xenophobic, whatever it is, it's told them, you can come out of the woodworks and you're good. You don't have to worry about anything. You can say offensive stuff, and if someone attacks you, you can just say, hey, oh, that's the, the far left, you know, that's their fault. Same thing happening in the U.S. Oh, that, that's the evil far left. And, um, you know, that's just cancel culture. So, um, Sexy Squad Family TV talked about a guy, um, Robert, oh, Robert Jobson. So this guy actually had the audacity to go on live television and say that baby Archie, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's child, baby Archie, should be dangled, or if they come to the coronation, Baby Archie should be dangled over the, the procession gate like Michael Jackson did with, um, I think it was Blanket. Okay, and since he deleted his Twitter. So, like, they, 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 they will send all of this hate, all of their cronies towards people who support Harry and Meghan. But the minute that Sexy Squad comes after clear racist, misogynist, xenophobic people, then uh, he, he, he just deactivated his Twitter. He deactivated his Twitter. And Brian from Sexy Squad Family TV, I really like the way that he made a comparison. He made a parallel between like back, you know, when, when Piers Morgan, when he was really, really, really going in. Uh, Meghan Markle back when he, he not, right now he has Piers Morgan uncensored or whatever and I guess he's trying to negotiate deals with other people but to a certain extent he has been blacklisted from British Hollywood or whatever and uh, this was back when he was with Good Morning Britain mm -hmm. GMB 
and he was talking to I can't remember the guy's name and the guy was basically and the guy who he was talking with at this time was another anchor on the show and he's of mixed race uh, origin but beyond that he was just speaking sense he was just speaking what you know the majority of everyday people are thinking right now what the heck is going on you know hate rhetoric is becoming so normalized what the heck is going on and this guy said to Piers Morgan essentially dude why are you so obsessed with her let it go let it go Piers Morgan just gets up and walks off and that was essentially the end of his career with Great Morning Britain it's like when will it click when will it click that you are not only ruining yourself you're not only ruining yourself, you are setting terrible implications and consequences and problems for generations to come. When will that click? So that's the same thing that I see with King Charles. You know, it's like um, I see someone who really is just not seeing. It's not clicking. Dude, this isn't a good idea. <laughs> isn't a good idea um my recommendation you know royalists monarchists who are out there watching this right now you know and and i'm not even a leftist i'm in the center okay so please listen listen to someone who understands where you're coming from i get it i get it life is hard your ideals your traditions your values are being questioned I get it. Trust me, I do. What you're doing, the path that you're following down, has terrible implications, not only for you today, but for generations to come. Okay? You're making yourselves out to look absolutely insane. Okay? King Charles, same thing. Same, same, same thing. Maybe he is not, you know, imploding like, uh, you know, the, this, this, this Robert guy or this uh, Piers Morgan guy or whatever. Maybe he's not imploding in the same way. But his lack of action to stand up for all people, it's, um, it has terrible implications. What's happening right now is the British monarchy is slowly, slowly going down. It's gonna, it's going to dissipate. It's going to dissipate if you guys keep going down this route. You think that this is defending it and saving it. This is destroying it. Step into the 21st century. Recognize that black peoples, brown peoples all around the world are people. You know, like I said, there's a comedian who said, we can't even agree on Black Lives Matter. Like, not or better, nothing like that, just matter. <laughs> we can't even agree on that, that just Black Lives Matter. If you don't think that this is interweaved in all of this, if you say, oh my God, I'm not a racist. Oh, people just race baiting. They like to throw out race. Try opening up your ears for one second. Okay? Try opening up your heart for one second, and I guarantee you, if you truly had black and brown people in your life to say, hey, this is hurting, this is hurting me, and this is hurting other people, I guarantee you it wouldn't be like this. I guarantee you. I don't see lots of pictures with anybody of other, other, the senior royals with blacks and brown, brown, brown people, other than diplomatic you know things related to duty but I don't see true forging friendships because it just doesn't work like that it's like I got a lot of Jewish friends if I said something that was very very anti-semitic um my Jewish friends would be like uh Najwa pfft, hold on one second yeah that's that's not gonna fly so you know King Charles, I, I, I think that he um, is digging himself deeper. He is about to get this monarchy um, swallowed up, destroyed. And, and, and it could have dangerous implications for he and his family. You know, it's like he thinks that he's baiting off these extremists who are essentially white supremacists by not denouncing racism and xenophobia. But what's actually going to happen is they're going to turn on him. 
you know, because that type of, of hate, that type of mental illness, there's no appeasing it. There's no appeasing it by just staying silent and complicit. The only thing I feel like that can be done is to eliminate the threat or education. For those who are far less radicalized, education will absolutely do. So take a look at Germany. Germany spilled hundreds of millions of uh, euro into government-sponsored programs that de-radicalizes, and the foundation of it is education. Just like I said, if you had some black and brown, Jewish friends, etc., women friends, you a long time ago somebody would have flagged you down. Hey, uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, hold on one second. Excuse me. Yeah, that that's 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 not gonna work. Education, but you know you can't be educated if you just feel like you already have all the answers. If you feel like you already have all the answers, nobody can educate you. So. I see Charles digging himself deeper. It's going to have very, very terrible implications for the, the monarchy. And um, I'm, a, I'm a person who feels like the monarchy adds such rich history to, to the United Kingdom. It's a part of that history. But in the 21st century, you should be able to address your violent and racist past. You should be able to denounce it for today. And it all comes up together. Angela Levin, Piers Morgan, um, you know, the hate groups that are stemming up. Even the hate that might essentially be inside of the royal family itself. That is all coming from this complacency about doing nothing. And eventually it's going to bubble up. It's going to bubble up and it's going to have terrible, terrible implications. Now, I get it. You know, I feel like... Um, King Charles giving that apology or renouncing hate before the 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 coronation might be um, he might feel like that that would incite more violence you know like that could be really dangerous for uh, the coronation and we already know that a lot of artists have dropped out of the coronation but the thing is is that right there highlights again the point that you should have done this. A long doggone time ago. You should have done this a long, long, long time ago. So now we're faced with a dilemma, you know. He can either keep going, digging his heels in, and this coronation just has a gray cloud just floating over it. Okay? Or... He could go ahead and say what's right, denounce racism, denounce xenophobia, and, you know, go into the coronation with some truth, with some honesty. You know, double up on, on security, but do what's right. Or they can make some sort of public statement denouncing racism, denouncing xenophobia, denouncing hate after the coronation. I think that's also a perfectly fine plan. Just do it. Just do it. Because you see right now in the U.S., Republicans, even like Mike Pence, are finally coming out. Tucker Carlson finally coming out and saying, we made a mistake. It is okay to say, I made a mistake. You know what? Generally, I feel like Queen Elizabeth II was warm, inviting. I feel like she introduced a level of hope. I do really feel like there was hope felt around her reign. Perhaps because you could see that even though she was a stern woman, behind that was compassion. You could see that in the interactions that people have with her. Now, I'm not going to say that she was without fault, but um, yeah, I guess it's, it's something that's really, really inherent and it can't be taught. Again, I feel like we're dealing with personality disorders, okay? But even if it can't be taught, education and advocacy, awareness, raising awareness is something that can happen. I feel like King Charles, maybe he should have had a few courses, okay? Maybe he, ha he should have had a few um, human resources <laughs> type courses to, to explain to him when you look like a big, fat, racist, xenophobic person who has 
uh, locked himself in the wind tunnel, not listening to any of the voices around him. Anyway, with that being said, let's take a look at some of this, um, some of this rhetoric. I'm sorry, not rhetoric. So essentially what I did was um, I pulled up an article speaking a bit about King Charles III's coronation. And then I pulled up one about Queen Elizabeth. Now let's look at Queen Elizabeth II's the first. So, um, first of all, you have here a picture here. Um, and this is an article from the Pessimist Archive. It says the Queen's coronation was almost banned from TV. Told you, those, those agro, exploding agro nerds out in Britain has been a thing for a very long time. How the British public overturned a live television ban on the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And it says, television ban for coronation arouses Britons. Uh, London, the wave of British national disappointment over the ban on live television during the crowning ceremony, Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Um, I think it says, next. June 3rd was to be aired today in the House of Commons. So basically to explain kind of what happened there, like they wanted to make the monarchy seem a bit more modern, a bit more with the times. And so there had been a discussion of airing it on TV. Now remember that seems like nothing now, but back then TV was a very rudimentary, rudimentary technology. It was very new. And, um, you can see the same thing happening today, even with King Charles's coronation. There's all this talk about how he's trying to modernize it. One way to modernize it is to not be racist and xenophobic. So basically, people were really up in arms about that. So it says on the other one, Queen throws opening crowning to TV cameras. Protests and video ban on coronation rights. Britain's Coronation Committee gave in to, na to nationwide protests today and lifted its ban on television. So, right there. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, at least they were listening to the British people back then. Because I know that it's not just Americans and uh, people from other countries talking about how Harry and Meghan were done wrong. I know that there's British people talking about it too. Pull up LBC, okay? Pull up Navarro Media. I see them. They're talking about it. Jesse Owens. Uh, I think his name is Jesse Owens. Yeah, there's people talking about it. But Britain ain't listening. So maybe that's the difference. At least they listened back then. So it says, on June 2nd, 1953, Queen Elizabeth was sworn as Queen of England. She was only 25. Charles is like, what, 72 or something? Prematurely turning from princess to queen after the old untimely death of her father, King George VI. His coronation 17 years prior was the first to be broadcast live over radio and the assumption was Queen Elizabeth's coronation would be similarly broadcast live via the latest broadcast innovation of the Times television. And we also know that Queen Elizabeth had a really, really strong relationship with her father. King Charles always had a relationship of deep contention with his mother, likely because he had a vastly different personality. His personality is touchy and boring and, you know, not really, I'm sorry, I don't want to say boring. I'll, I'll just say bland. I don't want to be mean. Um, he seems like, like I said, I feel like he might be on, on the spectrum. He just seems like he's not extremely aware of um, just socializing, you know, these, these, these under invisible kind of courtesies that you do when socializing amongst different kinds of people he seems a little bit privileged I, I have no idea how Harry came from that I, I really don't Harry is so relatable and so sweet and kind but at the same time he, he's not gonna sit there and let you you know just push him around I don't see that in Charles he just I 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as Nikola Tesla had predicted in 1926 when he imagined, we shall be able to witness and hear events, the inauguration of a president, just as though we were present. The coronation could now be experienced not just by royals and gentry, but by regular Britons, just as though they were present in Westminster Abbey. Now, I think that that was one of the biggest turning points for the monarchy and something that they've kind of been living with fear about ever since. I mean, it seems like to a certain extent, they are scared about exposing what their daily ins and outs look like and that makes sense that makes sense but maybe you should have set some of those boundaries much earlier on I, I don't know and how can you be so okay let's just say this real quick how can you be so intent on setting boundaries when you work directly with the trashy corrupt UK tabloid royal expert media who's pumping out gunk like every second of every day. How can you be trying to uphold this sense of silent dignity when like the machine that is the royal experts is pumping out gunk every day? I just don't get it. This, this right here is direct proof that the UK needs media reform. Like I said, the US is not perfect, but we know when something's wrong. We know when it's time to say, guys, we were wrong. The U.S. has had media reforms in the 30s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, in the 2010s, and it's happening again right now today. When something is wrong, just say, okay, like, yeah, it's okay, I'm going to backtrack. It's okay, we're human beings. It's okay to backtrack. You were wrong. Um, it was the, it was the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, who proposed the coronation be pe televised as one of his first recommendations as royal spouse. He believed it was an important step in modernizing the monarchy and making it more accessible to his subjects. The suggestion was met with resistance, including from the Queen Mother and then Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, who believed it would be unfitting that the whole ceremony, not only in its secular, but also in its religious and spiritual aspects, should be presented as if it were a theatrical performance. I can understand that to a certain extent. I can I can kind of understand that. I get it. So, um, then you have here again, Prince Philip's proposal was ignored, and on October 20th, 1952, the Royal Coronation Committee made the decision to ban live television cameras from the coronation. The British public were not happy, and the ensuing controversy was referred to by one outlet as one of the loudest controversies in years. And you see here a bunch of different news articles. One reads, Coronation TV Storm Grows. Another reads, Televising Coronation Rights Stirs Britain Into Uproar. The next reads, Coronation TV Ban, BBC Disappointed. This reminds me, as I've said many times, of the days when Britain used to guillotine people in public. It's totally got those vibes, right? Like, this right here just reminds me again, Britain needs to be pouring money, clearly that it doesn't have right now because Brexit was a dumb idea, but it needs to be pouring money into education. Education about tolerance, about critical race theory, okay? About these new conversations that we're having amongst an interfaith, uh, an inter-religious, uh, uh, interracial world that we live in today, it needs to be pouring money into that type of education and raising awareness on these issues. Raising awareness to let people know, like, this isn't the day of guillotining people in the, in the quarter, in the, in the quarter square, and you guys just sit around eating and, and screaming. Those days are over. Like, there needs to be education about that. But Britain doesn't have money to do that education because Brexit was like an ill-considered uh, move. Proponents of allowing televised, uh, live televised broadcasts of the coronation saw it as a de dem uh, democratizing force, extending the right to see the highest of public servants being anointed beyond high society and those lucky enough to be a royal by birth or marriage. That's the other thing. So I just recently talked in my video about atheists, um, this idea that atheists are smarter than um, 
than religious people. I look at Charles, and he looks like he might not really be a believer. I mean, he looks like I don't. I don't want to cast judgments on that. That how do I want to pose that? Um, Queen Elizabeth looked like someone who was very, very devout in her faith. And I don't see that from Charles. And so maybe that's the disconnect that I'm having with him. Because with Queen Elizabeth, I think I had a, a connection with her because of her faith. She was a woman of ardent faith, you know. But I don't see that from Charles. I believe that Elizabeth's father was as well. He seemed like the type of person who was. But, um... You know, in these corners of the internet, in these discussions with, kind of like I spoke in the video before about atheists, atheists, um, there is a, a, a energy around the most polarizing of their members um, where they really, anything related to anointment, religion, you know, birthright passed down from kings, Jesus, anything like that, it seems to really boil their blood and to my understanding, like, half of Britain is atheist now. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that, 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 that's, that has difficult implications. It's the same thing in the U.S., you know, like, a lot of people want to pull, um, the mentions of God out of, you know, administrative things like the national anthem, um, they want to pull nativity scenes types uh, depictions out of government buildings and things like that. But me as a person of faith, I have no problem with it. I have no problem with it. But I, I guess I can understand how people could have a problem with it. And I think that that just needs to be opened up for further discussion and uh, education and awareness on these things. It can't just be like, ah, people going crazy on social media and that's it. It's like there has to be open, fruitful, respectful conversations between people with differing opinions and then coming to some sort of compromise. That's what democracy is. Um, on 28th October, Prime Minister Winston Churchill made a statement in Parliament regarding the subject as our hope that it will prove possible and practice to carry into effect the principle that the world should see and hear what the congregation and the Abbey see and hear. So that's interesting. And I, and I have a feeling for many people that probably solidified their faith and it probably made them um, closer to their faith seeing that. But I, I, I imagine for some people, maybe it did absolutely nothing for them. And again, like I said, if that's the case, those conversations need to be made. But in general, you see from this article that there was way more um, excitement around her coronation. King Charles's coronation, you've seen with each event that he's done leading up to it, more and more protesters saying, not my king, are there, okay? You've seen that, um, you know, like, the, 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 um, the, 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 the artist that were going to play at the coronation, you've seen that most of them said, no, we're not doing it. Who would have turned down Queen Elizabeth II? Please tell me that. Not, not everyone. Maybe some people would have been busy, but not every single person approached. So, um, so then here's another one. The, U, the historic UK, um, the Coronation 1953 by Ellen Castello. And Ellen says, on 2nd June 1953, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II took place and the whole country joined in celebration. The whole country joined in celebration. They weren't like uh, protesting, not my queen. If there were some, definitely not the way that it is today. This is a personal account of that momentous day. The only problem on the actual day was the typical British weather. It poured with rain. But that didn't stop people all over the country holding parties in the decorated streets of their towns and cities in London and the roads were packed with people waiting to see the processions that took place. You know, the same thing happened with Harry and Meghan's wedding. I mean, Harry and Meghan, they wanted a nice little intimate affair. Britain, British people bowed, they bowed doggone 
beat them into a corner for them to televise that thing, standing out in the in the streets and everything. I told you, this is really coming from the days where they used to guillotine people in public. Like, um, that used to be entertainment for them. The mass London crowds refused to be downhearted uh, by the weather, and most of them had spent the night before on the crowded pavements, Jesus, waiting for the special day to begin. Dang, that's like the Apple Store opening, dude. That's like the Apple Store when it releases a new iPhone. This is serious. So, I mean, I'm not going to read all of this, but you get the idea. You get the idea. Queen Elizabeth represented something that was bigger than her. You saw her faith, you know. It wasn't questionable. I look at, at King Charles and I'm not really sure that I see the faith there. Especially not in his treatment towards Harry and Meghan. I mean, his treatment towards his own son, his mixed-race daughter-in-law, his mixed-race grandchildren, shows someone who is quite cruel, but also just might be completely oblivious. Again, like personality disorder. It might just be bipolar disorder. It could be um, sociopathy. It could just be like um, on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. But either way, cruelty, mental illness, whatever it is, Something is amiss. You don't. You, something is amiss in terms of faith, in, in terms of that raw faith, that raw warmth that was exuded from Queen Elizabeth II. And oftentimes, it, that just goes over people's heads. It reminds me of like when I talk to some of the the far right, right sort of uh, personalities who come into my more polarizing videos. I try to explain to them how microaggressions can hurt. I try to explain to them how racism really sticks with you your whole life and it hurts. Try to explain to them how figures like Trump are causing uh, dissent amongst marginalized people. And they just don't get it. It's like they really just don't get it. So I think that it's an emotional intelligence thing. It could also be an, intellect also be an intellectual intelligence thing or a combination of the both. But, um, it's, there's something off about it. Now, I found this last article is from Fox News. Last, I, like, hell would have frozen over before me thinking I would actually look at Fox News. But, I don't know, maybe since they're under so much fire, they're, like, appealing to a, a more left crowd. I don't know. But this article says, King Charles can't ignore Not My King protesters. Experts say the crown has been dented and tarnished. This is an article by Stephanie uh, Nolasco and Ashley Papa from Fox News. It says the king has been met with protesters from the anti-monarchy group Republic Holding. That my king signs leading up to the coronation. It says King Charles is choosing to keep calm and carry on. But some royal experts believe the monarchy needs a new strategy quickly before this coronation. During the Commonwealth Day service at London's Westminster Abbey, the 74-year-old faced a group of protesters from the anti-monarchy group Republic holding yellow signs that read, Not My King. We know all about that. The group has increased its activity in UK since Queen Elizabeth II, England's longest reigning monarch, passed away in September at age 96. So again... Lots of love around Queen Elizabeth II, not so much for King Charles. What's happening there? When the Queen was crowned in 1953, the mystic of the the mystique of the monarchy was still very much intact. Mm hmm Exactly. That's that's what it was. This this idea of that it was kind of not so much in the public eye was a thing back then. The world just watched in wonder as the ancient and awe-inspiring ceremony took place. And that has been ripped away by decades of scandal and controversy. The crown and, and not supporting Harry and Meghan, believe it or not, is the controversy. They think that Harry and Meghan were the controversy. They think that Harry and Meghan somehow are destroying the monarchy. The crown's lack of support for Harry and Meghan is the controversy. It's taking them so long to realize this. The crown has been dented and tarnished by so much headline making turmoil over the years. He shared, the king can only pray that at least his coronation will come off without a hitch. Even if it does, the honeymoon period, which really began with Elizabeth's death, will not last much longer. So, um, you know, it just talks more about essentially people who want to see the monarchy come down, 
some some um, members of the Commonwealth wealth speak. Um, same thing. Commonwealth people felt a connection with Elizabeth, not with Charles. Um, uh, yeah, it says there's no secret that people would like to see William and Kate on the throne instead. It also speaks a little bit about Harry and Meghan in here. It says that um, after the couple released a six-part docuseries on Netflix that detailed their struggles with royal life, Harry wrote an explosive memoir titled Spare, where he further criticized the royal family. While promoting the book, the 38-year-old accused the Queen's consort, his mother, of leaking private conversations to the media to burnish her own reputation. He singled out that the 75-year-old's efforts to rehabilitate her image with the British people after a long-time affair with her father that made her dangerous because of the connections she has forged with the British press, Harry told CBS, there was an open willingness on both sides to trade information. And with a family built on hierarchy, with her on the way to being queen concert, there was going to be people or bodies left in the streets. The father of two repeated his claims that there was concern about Archie's color, blah, blah, blah. They talk about the Oprah, the Oprah interview. Um, Harry insisted that his family wasn't racist, but said the episode was an example of unconscious bias. King Charles has not seen an increase of protests against the monarchy since the death of Queen Elizabeth II, said Schofield. That's lies. Responding to a media freedom of information request, London's Metropolitan Police recently confirmed that the Met Police Service has not recorded a noticeable increase in protests against the monarchy and its members since September 2022. Lies. I think we're seeing an increase in media coverage of the protests because of not only the coronation, but Harry and Meghan's antics. Gaslighting. Again. <sighs> Guys, media reform. Again, I've said in the video, British people watching this call for media reform in your country. It has to be media reform. Like, that is the quickest way to get into this. This nasty um, collaboration between the Crown and the corrupt UK media has to come down. That is the first step, okay? Media reform. People are trying to gauge how much Harry's behavior is hurting the monarchy. Is he influencing a revolt? As the new sovereign, King Charles has received relatively well. I'm sure Charles is thankful. His pushback has just been an egg or mean sign. So right there, it tells us exactly why Charles did not see his son when he came to the UK. It's because he resents him. He resents him. And he, for some reason, follows the counsel of these crazy people online, the, the tabloid media thinking that it is Harry's fault that the UK is experiencing the pushback towards the monarchy that it is right now. It's not Harry's fault. Um, surely some of the protesters sympathize with Harry and Meghan, but I don't think that's why they are protesting, Schofield continued. The UK protests and strikes the way we sneeze here in the, in the States. It's constant, and I do think some media outlets magnify the protest and try to fit it into the Harry and Meghan drama category. Okay. Okay, at least this person is admitting it. So apparently the Schofield person is American, I think. So, Or it's a British person living in America. So I guess, yeah, maybe there's some insight there. Charles will be formally crowned on May 6th at London's Westminster Abbey during a ceremony the palace says will combine elements of tradition with modern touches that highlight the changing face of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Again, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. Modern touches that are, you know, correspondent with the, the, the times that the monarchy lives in. If you guys want to put some modern touches with the times that we live in, Renounce hate, renounce racism, renounce xenophobia. Charles, pick up the phone and call your son. William and Kate, pick up the phone, call your brother and your sister-in-law. Recognize your friggin' uh, grandchildren, nieces and nephews. Talk to the British public. Say, we were wrong. We denounce racism, xenophobia, hate. Invest in some educational programs. 
Um, you guys are spending a whole lot of money trying to keep small boats from coming into England. You're spending a whole lot of money trying to push a xenophobic rhetoric. Maybe spend some money on education to de-radicalize the extremists who are racist, xenophobic, sexist. And start at one place. One place. Reform the media. And I am urging King Charles, monarchists, anybody who's listening to this, this coronation has a gray cloud over its head because your country has shown that the black and brown people inside of it don't matter. That many of the women and the poor people inside of it don't matter. You can do something about that. If you don't know where to start, seek the right counsel. Speak to the United Nations. Speak to social justice charities and causes that are centered around causes that want to dismantle white supremacy and racism and xenophobia. Don't go and donate to nameless charities, you know, actor beasts, you know, uh, what do they call them? Extra number two. Approach it head on. Do what you really need to do. So I will leave it there, guys. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Um, if you have not already, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you know whenever I post a video. And I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye.